All right, well, I think we're almost done thinking about all the different processes. I think just one more idea I wanted to mention. We can imagine doing a process very slowly or very quickly. Now, it turns out that one of these tends to be isothermal and one tends to be adiabatic. So let's take a second to figure out who goes with whom. Would we expect that a slow process would be adiabatic or isothermal? Or would we expect that a quick process would be isothermal or adiabatic? Who goes with who here? Um, a slow process would be isothermal and a quick one would be adiabatic? That is correct. Can you give an argument for either of those? Um, yeah, I think just because the, the change in pressure and final volume is a lot more gradual for isotherm than an adiabatic, like a, a really steep, quick change. <laughs> OK, I see. I think that might not quite work. It's true this is steeper, but this is not a pressure versus time graph. So we, we're saying that the pressure changes more quickly when you change the volume, but that, has no speci that does not necessarily tell us how quickly time is changing. Mm -hmm. So the steepness here does not tell us directly about what's happening in time. Um, your guesses were correct, but I think we'll need different explanations for those. Um, if you do a process very quickly, well, if you do a process very quickly, there's just not time for it to gain or lose much heat. Mm -hmm. That's the basic reason why an adiabatic process is quick. Remember, an adiabatic process is one where there's no heat exchanged. Mm -hmm. Well, if the process is very quick, there's just not enough time for much heat to come in or out. as what, why our slow processes tend to be constant temperature. Well, let's say that you have a system and you just leave it alone for a long time. What will happen to a system if you leave it alone for a very long time? Well, it will come to equilibrium with the temperature of its surroundings. We talked about that a little bit last time. In equilibrium, a system and the surroundings should have the same temperature. So uh, if you give something enough time, it'll have the same temperature as its surroundings. Well, um, if we allow a process to go very slowly, that will, um, what will happen is that the system will always stay at the same temperature as its surroundings. We usually think that it's much more difficult to change the temperature of the surroundings than of the gas. The surroundings is the whole rest of the universe, and the gas is just one little system. Um, so if you gave it enough time, it would always come back to the same temperature as the surroundings. That's a little bit of an argument for why when things go slow, their temperature should, uh, should stay constant. So again, the idea is, you can imagine that probably the gas started at the same temperature as the surroundings. Mm -hmm. And if you conduct the process very slowly, well, it should basically stay in equilibrium, stay at the same temperature as its surroundings. Uh, if you're trying to go very quickly, there might not have been enough time for the, temperatures to, for the temperature of the gas to um, equilibrate with the temperature of the surroundings. Okay. Uh, but if you're going slowly, um, you would expect that it could stay at that same temperature as the surroundings. Maybe it's easier to understand why an adiabat is a quick process. Um, Quick processes tend to be adiabatic because there's not enough time for heat exchange. This is a little confusing to me because it's a little hard to see how a very quick process could be reversible because a reversible process is supposed to be almost in equilibrium. So I'm not quite sure how those things go together. But anyway, for solving problems, if they tell you the process is very quick, that tends to be a hint that it's an adiabat. Okay. And if they tell you it's slow, that tends to be a hint that it's going to be an isothermal process. One or two more hints. Let's say that they say that the, the piston uh, or the cylinder is thermally insulated. I talked about this in the other series of videos. If it's thermally insulated, would that make it isothermal or adiabatic process? Uh, isothermal? So that's actually adiabatic. <laughs> Not <doing so. laughs> What's the purpose of insulating your house? Um, so that there isn't heat yeah. loss. That's right. The reason why you put in insulation is to prevent heat exchange. Mm -hmm. So you can see that insulation should go with adiabatic processes, which are ones where you don't want the heat to change. Okay. okay. So the purpose of insulation is to prevent heat exchange. So that goes with an adiabat. Probably maybe what might have uh, lured you into that guess is this therm over here. There's a therm and there's a therm over here. So that's a little mis misleading. I just thought that if the temperature would remain in equilibrium. But I guess that doesn't now, actually, if something is thermally insulated, that's the one case where its temperature does not have to be the same as its surroundings. Right. In fact, it can change to be something different from its surroundings. Yeah. That's the whole purpose of insulating your house again. The outside is cold, but since your house is insulated, it can stay warm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, okay. In any case, 
Um, even though, uh, so maybe that's not what confused you, but I think it might confuse some people that this has got the, the phrase thermally in it, but it doesn't go with isotherm, it goes with adiabat. Uh, on the other hand, if they tell you that the gas is um, in contact, is in equilibrium with um, a, 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 its surroundings in terms of temperature, that would tend to be an isothermal process. So for example, sometimes, oftentimes they like to say, put the cylinder in a big bath of water. Well, we don't expect the bath of water to change temperature very much because it's so big. Mm -hmm. um, and, if the, and we would expect that to keep the, the cylinder at the same temperature as what it's in. So the way to keep the temperature from changing is to uh, put it in surroundings that it's not insulated from. So it stays at that same temperature. Yeah. And the way to uh, keep the heat from exchanging is to insulate it. Okay, so that was uh, quite a bit of material we went through there. Some of that was a review from the other video series you saw, but I think you saw that we went over also a bunch of equations that I didn't have time for in that other series. So there is a bunch of different ways that this is tested. Mm -hmm. uh, but now I guess we're finally ready to do some uh, problems. So let's see uh, how this would come up with some examples. Did you have any questions? Not so far, no. It'll be a lot clearer how, the, how this works if we look at some problems. Okay. Part A. Find the pressure at point C. Because it we'll have to decide that when we decide what equation we're going to use. Okay. That will tell us whether the units matter. That's actually, there was still something I didn't cover. I meant to talk about that, but I forgot. But we'll get to that when we decide what equation to use. Okay. Um, so I guess I would just start by labeling the pressures and volumes. I'm glad you mentioned that. That's right. We don't want to be lazy. We want to put all the information we can into our, into our graphs. So let's okay. go ahead and do that. That's a very good idea. Pictures. You've got plenty of room, but that's just what it will work. To our graph. Good. So it seems like we know the pressure and volume of everything except the pressure of point C. We know the volume of point C. Um, oh, I didn't put that in. We know this pressure too? Yeah, 1.5 atmospheres. Good. That's right. So it's always good to use a question mark for what we're trying to figure out. And go ahead and feel free to use all the, uh, the, the, the cheat sheet that we just developed, like you would on the test, to decide what would be the right approach here. Okay. Um, so, you know that the work from C to B equals zero. Great. Um, Let's go ahead and put everything we figure out in our picture. Okay. So the work for this process is zero. I guess I got the arrow wrong here. Oh, really? Oh. Well, obviously, if we're, yeah, we're going from A to B, and then we're going from B to C. So I just miscopied the arrow. Yeah. OK. okay. So the um, work for this portion is zero. Good. And I think because the whole path is cyclic, you know that um, delta U is equal to zero. Delta U for the whole cycle 
is zero. That's something that you, that you saw maybe in the other series of videos. We didn't talk about that, but we know from the other series of videos, delta u is a state function. Mm -hmm. So for any cyclic process, delta u is zero. Good. And then um, from c to a, mm -hmm. uh, q is equal to zero. So we can put that in our picture as well. Good. Uh, and then I'm not sure what you would know about a to b except that you can find the work. That that's you right. Well, that's well put. Okay. A straight line process is not doesn't fall into any of the special types we talked about before. Mm -hmm. We didn't uh, just a, an upward sloping line. That's not isothermal or adiabatic or anything. So we don't have any special information about that. Although you're right, we could find the work if we need it. Mm -hmm. Okay.